Uh, when I talked with Bill, and I asked Bill what might be an appropriate, how, how I might want to introduce uh, the work we've been doing, um, you know, me, Chris, Laura, and some other artists in the network, and Bill suggested that I go through basically a survey of different kinds of work that we've done. That's one thing I will try to do tonight. I also talked with Chris, and uh, we thought there might be an opportunity to introduce some of the themes, some of the questions that are motivating, you know, desires and questions are motivating the work that we've done over the past now, what, seven years or so, something like that. So I have to try to satisfy both of these, uh, both of these desires, okay, tonight. So, um, so on the menu, so this is the menu for today. I have to apologize, I'm going to, thanks Chris, to, uh, I have to resort a little bit to PowerPoint, this PowerPoint is even though we hate it so much, okay? Because some of the terms are going to be uh, helpful if you maybe just have them digitally as well. So I'm going to try to go through a few public experiments that we've done. We, we meaning sponge, calling these uh, public experiments, but also to try, maybe toward the end, to try to motivate uh, what I call topological media. I'm not going to define it because I don't even know what it is, all right? It's taken another 10 years. But I'm just thinking that that is a nice, uh, you know, nice, nice empty signifier we can use to try to think of an alternative way to, um, to work with computational media. So I'm just going to show you first, first off a couple of projects quickly and see. Um, the first one is about this is that 
leverage the physical world. You know, if we want to do motion blur, use real particles of sand. And if we want to actually blow the works around, hold the, hold the microphone up to the wind and use the sound of the wind to drive the uh, deformation of the text. Okay? So, we then did some installations in the San Francisco Exploratorium. For lack of time, I'll skip it. I just wanted to give you a few seconds of this to indicate that we wanted to, I would like to deploy these speech sensitive surfaces in many, many different kinds of, let's say, urban or pseudo urban environments. Each one will be very much tuned to the specific social dynamics of the space. To give some credit to the people who are working on these different projects, uh, we did installations in Brussels, test installations in San Francisco, Brussels, and Urbanta. And uh, so uh, if you have detailed questions, you can ask James about it. James should about that. Here's more recent work. More on the speech. Speech recognition is full of errors, but our approach takes advantage of this feature of the technology. Since the words that come out may not match what you say, and in any case dissolve away after some time, a hub up installation is not a surveillance, but a playful system. Uh, I am crazy, crazy boy. Thank you. 
this town. What we did was we built uh, three tubes like this. Uh, and as you walk through underneath the tubes, underneath these tubes, you're going through three zones, acoustic zones. And Chris is working with acoustics. You can ask Chris about that, that part of the project. But also going underneath this intense strobe light. So the idea was to actually go in and out, in and out through the different perceptual densities of space. Okay? So they're not projecting images. They're just projecting uh, textures of light and textures of sound. Um, and the sound was, uh, for the sound, we, well, Chris did all sorts of processing of the ambient sound environment and putting it back in. Everything was also parameterized by the activity uh, on the sidewalk. The optical activity on the sidewalk. So this experiment was, I think, actually less, less uh, successful in terms of immersion, but taught us a lot about how to begin to deploy some of these um, responsive media technologies out into open space, uncontrolled space. Some credit. Uh, now we come to tea garden. The tea garden project was really, well, what was the dream? The dream was. Originally, the idea is that you, you, if you walk around in, a, in, a, in, a, in any kind of space passing other people, I always wear black, I should always wear something with patterns on it. Uh, the idea is if you have patterns on your body and you pass by another body, the pattern on your body will bleed off to the body of your past, the person you pass by. So if I have a salamander on my skin, I wave my arm next to somebody else's arm, maybe the salamander will crawl from my, my arm to her arm, etc. Okay? So this idea of you know, this kind of exchange of tattoos, I mean, it's a, it's a theme that has occurred to, to other people as well. It was part one of the original dreams. Another part of this uh, idea is that if you walk around, you leave behind you traces of yourself. It could be air currents, it could be echoes of your voice, hair, it could be you know, uh, threads from your body, right? Just any, all these kinds of material detritus that comes back in a wake, in your wake. And I'm interested in seeing how people, when they pass each other, um, conduct these kinds of material conversations, or rather, how this matter, these pieces of matter, this flock them and jets that they leave behind you, how these intermingle with one another and create a kind of material conversation, even without your knowing. Okay. So that's another part of the dream of the pea garden space. We wanted to be able to explore how people can play in such a space, gesturally, without appealing to language, so that so we don't really have people necessarily using Spanish or Japanese or English to to tell each other what to do or to say what, how they feel to one another. And we're interested in this kind of, uh, this kind of material conversation. Uh, why do we call it tea garden? For, for that, we were thinking in terms of, of course, uh, tea for time, tea for transformation, uh, tea, for, tea for this idea that instead of um, starting with bodies, this is going to be a theme throughout the rest of the talk tonight, instead of starting with, uh, with bodies as given, thinking of always of this, this idea of bodies in transformation, of bodies coming out of fields and then dissolving back into the field. So this idea of emergence of, of a body. And that kind of emergence of bodies and objects, how would that be possible? This is where we begin to look forward to topological media. It will be made possible in this way from the view of the world as the plenum, as a density. So the way I think of the world is not as objects in void, in vacuum, you know, this idea of atoms in space, right, with nothing in between. And then, like, you know, poor ego and poor other, and this vacuum in between me and other, this infinite bridge, between, infinite gap between me and you, which has to be bridged by what? By eros, by language, who knows? You know, by techne, what is it? Okay? There's all these conundrums that come up, which has been very hard to solve. Instead, what if we start with a Spinozan view of the world, or a pre Socratic view of the world, or in fact, Taoist view of the world, which thinks of the world, the universe, as a plenum, as a thickness, in which thickness which would have infinitely many uh, nuancings or modalities from which many bodies could form and dissolve. I have to restart this. This is the kind of, these are the kind of thinkings that we had in mind. This is the kind of idea we had in mind when we went to build the tea garden system, tea garden environments. And let me show you some videos from three years ago of the tea garden. choosing one of five or six fantastical costumes. The reason for these costumes being fantastical, here's a designer, Kaki Ek from my kids in the Netherlands. 
uh, with a very hoopy costume. The reason these costumes are so fantastical is to take you out of your ordinary body. So we just, just estrange the body from itself. This is a dancer, and he, we gave him a styrofoam, you know, Michelin man, called the Michelin man costume, which makes you much bigger, and much more volume, volume, but we weigh the same. It weighs almost zero, right? We built it on the compact iPad computers with Wi-Fi, uh, beaming, beaming data from the accelerometers, which in this case we could build, we could build onto the, his arm and on his chest, on his chest. Uh, so then you walk, you're released into a space. You can play in this kind of space free. We tell the people very little, but we do say, in, in, in the dressing ritual, we say you're putting on a new body and you're putting on a new voice. Please play, but attend very carefully to how, what's happening to you as you play. And we have many hours of documentation, but let me just play a little bit. I like my costume. I, I was born in the, how do you call it, the one with dreams. Mm -hmm. So it felt like, you know, I was in a big, um, but, you know, that was very free my movements. And, um, and, yeah, there was this thing, it's like, you know, you go inside and you, and you feel this sort of experience. At first, I didn't really know what was going on. I didn't learn as you go along. And uh, I think Gabriel was, what he was trying to say is that he didn't know um, who was producing the sounds that he was hearing. Said, no, get, get away. <laughs> I really like the boss, but I wonder whether they do not, um, whether they stand in the way of people finding out what they are actually doing. I wonder. Because I remember when I was in this space, I was like, you know, running around the balls and just like, you know, playing with the balls instead of finding out, like, if I do this, then this happens. So I, I don't know, but I think they're really nice. syntax in the sense that you can do anything and it makes a sound. It might sound horrible, but it makes a sound. There's no syntax error, right? It's not like you have to play exactly this millimeter or that millimeter in order to get the sound, get the system to, to respond. If you don't, can you imagine the virtual bound that needs to be rebooted if you put the place, put the the wrong place? You know? <laughs> so, it doesn't work like that. So, here's another beautiful example of learning. Okay, since there's so much volume, say it and then get you watch it, it's because it's very quick. In this case, um, uh, Ana Maria 
this dance thing, and she's going to hear too. Actually, she, you know, I should just have you come up and say to talk about this part. The room has a kind of a constant circle. It also, so the room has its own sound. It's going mm, 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 like this. But she, every body, every person in this room also has uh, an instrument of sorts, a soft piece of software that follows the body's motions. And at some point, you're going to hear a chirp kind of sound appearing. It's that kind of chirp <coughs> appears because of the cumulative energy. It's like a cascade model that, that, that begins to kick in because she's moving and building up enough energy. She won't know this until about three or four beats later. And then we'll see if something happens. I'll point to her. And then at that point, only later does she realize this wash of sound. In this wash of sound, something was, dis was disambiguating. Something in that wash of sound is actually due to hers. It becomes her voice. And she's going to try to improvise and come up with a repertoire of gestures that allows her to play the room in such a way to elevate even further, to surface even more that part of the sound, which she will then identify as her voice. Okay, so let's watch this happening. Thank you. 
you know, basically cocky egg quantity to make people fly. Uh, down here you see the background some electroluminescent piping because I used to think some kind of primitive version of world war architecture. You walk into this wall and you should move around. You can't actually dance anymore or fly. You're very much attached to the uh, to the to the wall itself. Um, but your motions are mapped to musical textures. And then the ball itself was instrumented as well, so it became a free floating instrument. Okay. <coughs> the idea for all of these, okay, is that we're trying to do experiments on how people can play together in a fixed space. This is very much unlike the way that laboratory work is done in science. In science, what you do is you actually abstract away most of the variables, right? You hold everything else constant, you only vary temperature, right? Or you only vary blood pressure. That's how you do science, and that's how you do research, that's how you generate knowledge. The approach that I would like to take, and now I'm speaking more maybe to people in, let's say, colleagues in scientific domains, the approach that I'm proposing, the reason why it's fun, for example, is that we do experiments is that we try to learn something that we can actually then use in science, some other kind of environment, not just a one-shot piece of knowledge that's only bound to maybe one piece of art, okay? So, but it is also very much attuned to real experience, real life experience. Thank you. 
on many different areas in interaction design technologies and human computer interaction, in computer science, architecture, industrial design, etc. So here are some of the people. Uh, uh, there are also a couple of faculty I've been involved with as well. These are master's students and uh, PhD students. The kind of work, now switching over, not, not switching on the public domain experimental sponge, but more specific to the work I'm doing at Georgia Tech in the, in the, in the laboratory, the academic environment. Okay? And you can think of this kind of the, like the research arm. It's a research uh, project that were spun out from those bunch projects that I'm now trying to carry on inside the university with talented designers and scientists. <clears throat> scales of work. Uh, one way to lay out this different kind of work is at least in multiple scales. For example, the finest scale is the scale of a gesture. The amount of energy, time, space it takes to make maybe a stroke. Or even, even finer scale would be the kind of micro textures it takes in a level 10 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds. I mean, it's kind of roughness. A middle scale would be scale, now let me go back up. A middle scale would be, would be more like the, the motion for a complete gesture, like this. Okay, like this, right, or like this. Okay, the amount of energy, time it takes to make a gesture, which is more, more like a body scale. At the larger scale, which put one more here, uh, would be the scale of the space, energy, time it takes to occupy a room, something like this. And this year, we're beginning to move to, out, um, to read studies that might be how to work with uh, in events at the scale of a whole building. Okay? I'm not going to show pictures of that today, but maybe in six months, we'll be able to show images of that kind of work. The core themes for the topology media lab involve gesture, of course, uh, mat material materiality, what makes something tangible and palpable, and, um, and notion of agency. Okay? Materiality. What makes something tangible and palpable is easy if you're looking at something like wood, okay? Um, or even air, I suppose. It's actually much less, of course, uh, uh, clear if we're talking about something like a, like a Riemannian manifold or, or seven-dimensional torus, right? Or freedom. And if this idea of plenum, remember I was talking about plenum, think of the universe as one substance with many, infinitely many modes. If that approach is to really work for us, then we would like to have a way to work with that material all at once. We don't want to have one technology for words, another technology for abstractions like mathematics, and another technology for working with wood and steel. We want to have a way to work fluidly across these different kinds of things. It's a lot of talk, verbiage, let's say, about hybrid, hybrid this and that, like physical stuff and computational stuff. There's quite another, I think, to really have um, an understanding, a design understanding, or an, uh, a kind of aesthetic, ethical aesthetic understanding, a technical understanding that allows to these very radically different ontological strata. Okay. So, then there are consequences. <clears throat> Part of this has to do with, of course, what I just mentioned, just in passing, this notion of an ethical, aesthetic way of working with media. Again, referring to Guattari. More in terms of craft and art and engineering, these are six lines of work that we're doing in topological media lab. So it involves, uh, very importantly, this notion of media choreography. And uh, instead of just telling humans where to go and how to move, we have to actually take time-based media, like this video, and say, well, you should actually flow like this, or you know, like in response to people congregating over that corner. So how would you actually do that? Um, also thinking of video and sound as, as, as media that you can pour and mix together. Um, not just metaphorically, but really, to, you know, really make a system that where it actually behaves like that. <clears throat> Uh, the fun part right now is some new work we're doing is uh, in, the, in the domain of body and fabric-based sensing. Fabrics that can change colors in response to people's activities or environmental stuff, and some more technical work. I'm starting to go on like this because I feel like there should be time for questions, but I guess if you can hang on and write your questions down, you can, you can just do it all at once at the end. How are we doing this time? Okay, good. Okay. Now, yes, I wish I could. The idea is that, um, how many of you have worked with active fabrics, like thermochrome makings, or piezos, and you know, electroluminescent stuff, or fiber optics, or must have some people worked with that. Okay, so, um, okay. well, you, you know, people know, at least from reading, that uh, we already have, uh, well, some companies like DuPont, and um, also some other companies like France Telecom have demonstrated uh, fabrics that can change color, right? I mean, change color, or you can even primitively approximate that by wiring some LEDs together and putting fiber optics out, okay? I'm just jumping ahead and saying, okay, let's assume we've got this technology.
challenge them. Uh, we have access to some of these kinds of some of these kinds of um, some of these kinds of um, materials that you can actually find them yourselves. You can get some thermal coming inks. You can get actual luminescent inks and dyes. You can try silk screening yourself. But assuming you've got that kind of material that can change color, what would you do? Right? How how would you actually play those kind of things? So I'm thinking of using that. I'll say that later on as a kind of a tissue rather than. Dust. Dust becomes fire. <laughs> so, uh, this is uh, custom work that Yocho has done based on um, physics models. Okay, so in other words, underneath this, there's a lot of modeling of the bits. Okay, jitter gives us a framework. This is jitter. How many of you jitter? Jitter? Some of you? Great. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm not paid by cycling for asking for a question. <laughs> okay, so um, based, on that, based on that framework, what we've done is basically imported a bunch of physics so that we can actually treat video as a physical medium. So you can treat video like dust, we can treat video like fluids, we can treat video like fire. So we can model these things. We can model combustion, model uh, fluid flow, we can, well, not yet, we can model wave mechanics, and we can model heat, for example. So we can, we can take video and heat it in some way. That's the easiest one. Okay? So, and we can take light and we can take light intensity and treat light as heat. You see? So this is part of this idea that we can take video itself and treat it not as <laughs> an object in a frame, but as a medium that we can just pour on bodies. Okay? So now we can begin to do this. Similarly, with sound. Thank you. 
body in the room is treated as a gravitating source. And this blobby thing, which you can barely see, is a mass which is computed in real time by Eric Conrad uh, based on a field model, a field that where the sources of the field are your bodies. Okay. So, and the idea here in this case was that the pumping of the hand is only one of several cycles that come from the body. That is, the body itself can be seen as, as basically the spectrum of many, many, many different kinds of cycles of movements. You take the whole body and feed the whole body's spectrum into the musical system. It's not like saying, I push this button to get one sound, or even that I move one, one move from here. The whole body can be thought of as a very complex set of emotions. And the complex set of emotions can be uh, fed into the musical system and responds in a spectral way. That's it. OK, enough of that for now. But it's, it's a thing. It's a much richer way of dealing with gesture, gestural sound. Suffice to say. Software. Now I'm doing software. OK. So these are the kinds of things that we're using. But these are, these are why. Remember I said that one of the dreams of the tea was the idea of pattern uh, of an infection of tattoos and, and you had to play with the idea of patterns passing a sound message from body to body to body. Uh, the, the, all this work with video was kind of a stopgap measure. It's, it's because we didn't have access to materials to actually you know, take tattoos and then pass and bleed and pass patterns from body to body. So with the software, this kind of wear, software yard, uh, we can begin to play with the bodies like that. So the general idea is to, uh, what, I could, what I have to do is to take the space itself, from the skin to the, to the furniture to the walls, as a fixed space, or I take the space with different densities, and ask, what if, with our different media, we could actually densify or rarefy space in different ways? How does that change the body? Or that is, how, how do bodies emerge out of that kind of variations in density? Because, you, for example, you could say, maybe, if, um, let's say we take the ego and dissolve into a field, erotic fields, linguistic fields, social fields, okay? Dissolve all the fields in here, all of, the, all of you here, into a field model, okay? For, from the point of view, look at it this way, from the point of the planet Earth, where's the little blips in the gravity field, right? I may be in the slight densification of the gravity field. From the point of view of cosmic rays, we're transparent, right? From the point of view of flesh, there's definitely a boundary here. But just for the moment, just imagine that we're in this field picture of the world, that you're looking at yourselves as gravity instead, just for a while, okay? How would we re reconstitute ourselves under playful activity? So, for example, maybe it's kind of a shock. Remember that red thing that the OHO just waved his hand and shot? Suppose I come up here and I invade your space, right? Go like this. It's a shock, kind of some, in some sense. And maybe that shock is what defines another boundary between my body and your body, okay? So a new skin appears, so I can say, hey, just with saying, hey, Okay, that defines a new kind of body, kind of a linguistic body, a linguistic skin between my body and your body. So it's that kind of play I could be able to think of as being possible by this kind of media. Okay. So, um, let's see if I can skip some of these things. Here. Um, what we're doing is we're playing in many, many different ways where we use. Oh, let me just play with that video. Show you some of the gear. Okay, let's, let's, let's do, do engineering tech for a while. The sensor data is transmitted efficiently to a base station. This is for engineering audience. I apologize for the soundtrack. We have a push model and by encapsulating the data into a small packet size. Secondly, the Rene is equipped with force sensitive resistors which respond to pressure, which are then embedded inside clothing, including a glove and a full shirt. What we do next is we went to Ubicom, a computer science conference, and we had to demonstrate that these kinds of things were useful. So our example was, our example was reading, this is Joe Fantoso's work, and, and a whole bunch of people working with her. Uh, we decided to model, well, this is Max, this, okay, this is a, uh, just to show you. This is using magnetic field. Cells, incident light, uh, accelerometers, etc. Okay, these are the chips you can you can read all sorts of analog data as well. What we did was we went there and said, well, what happens when you actually greet each other? What are the dynamics of approach, greeting, and disengagement? So then we made a costume, set of costumes, and we decided to take it to Seattle, and this is what we built. It's a kind of a in this segment, we see a solo performer wearing instrumented software. 
using a range of expressive gestures as she walks. Then he sets her sewn into her garment sleeve, transmit art with him to parameterize naturalistic ambient sound fields. Mercury switches and potentiometers light her LEDs based on her movement. We take as inspiration for ubiquitous technology the ancient and highly sophisticated crafts of clothing and textile design. We build wearables that are first and foremost comfortable and aesthetically plausible as clothing and jewelry. Instead of starting with devices, we start with social practices of body ornamentation and corporeal play, solo, parallel, or collective play.
So instead of potato subjects, subjectification, the fields of subjects from which subjects can emerge, or uh, the general plena from which objects can emerge. That's the approach I want to take. They can be worked on different ways. In the domain of the body, <coughs> I'm working with a group of artists, a set of artists, for example, um, some of the film artists, Maya Kuzmanovich, Nina Kuzeti, Christina Anderson, who's a socialist sign at the moment, uh, Nicola Feldman Kiss in, in Canada, Joy Brzozowska in Concordia, Montreal, and I, and also Leticia Tsunami, who's a musician uh, working with the Ladies Club in San Francisco. We would like to be able to explore some of these ideas about how bodies can be conjured by gesture. First, we have a set of gestures, then see what bodies emerge. The metaphor I have, now that you have for that is if you work for example, in an orchestra, if you look at an orchestra play, at the moment, every body, every first bottom bows up. That's one movement, and there's only one body. It's the first bottom section that bows up. All the bows are in unison. Okay, so that's one body. Same thing with the core of the dancers. That could happen. At some point, there's a group of dancers that are all moving in this kind of parallel motion. That's one body right there. At that moment, it breaks out from the general core of bodies of the dancers. Yes. So do we not try to look at that kind of question in the case of uh, these kinds of the software pieces of on a larger scale. Whoops, hmm, let's go back. And I mentioned this before, so I'll put it up in words now. This is a this is an interesting question. Is it possible to have some sort of magma, some sort of social magma, or maybe more like a not just social, of course, a kind of social ontological magma, in which we can have ethical aesthetic gestures emerge from this kind of general magma, this kind of eight, I'm going to be very jargony for a minute to save time. To be able to work the level below the level of language, a level above the level of matter, so it's um, it's 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 not quite what semioticians would call signifying. So you can skip the semiotic classes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I doesn't, that's what it responds to <laughs> what I heard earlier. But uh, but still have still the possibility of making ethical and aesthetic gestures. Okay. This is just a very. I hope you ask questions because this is a large amount of stuff. Into, into one, two, three, four words. Okay. Another way the subject can work out is in the domain of performance, which goes back to, to earlier work with tea gardens and, and, um, and sponge, which is, see, explicit, in, instead of doing explicit uh, piece of theater or explicit lines you have to deliver by explicit actors and roles and like this, we could ask, this is something that Chris and Laura presented to me as a challenge, how can we make, this is a, one of the originating questions for sponge, that Chris and and Nanara challenged me with, okay? Um, how can people, collections of people, get together <coughs> and construct an experience which is as powerful as the experience of watching, in, in its day, a performance of a work, let's say, by Bertha Brecht, or Pina Bausch, or Bob Wilson, okay? Or, or more recent work, like a dumb type, for example, some of you have seen maybe a dumb type video recently. Okay, is it possible to have such a collection, collected collection of people go through such an event without appealing to some explicit narrative structure. So I would think you might can make it more radical. How about, is it possible without appealing even explicitly to language, to speech, or to text? What do we have to work with? Well, anybody in music or dance or visual arts will say, much, we have a lot to work with, okay? Or Arto himself will say, well, we have a lot to work with. We have all the technologies for the mise en scène to work with, okay? So that's the kind of work we're trying to do, make it possible with our computational media. Goes back to, and underneath that is the question of phenomenology. This idea that maybe we can maybe come into such an environment, such a complex, not just with the artificially constructed technologies or computational media, with all the sedimented experience that we carry in with us as bodies and as subjects. We bracket it, but we don't we don't throw it away. Okay, I'm deliberately using phenomenological language. surface physics. I mean, it's been done for a long time, but to call it nanotechnology makes this kind of material sciences very sexy. So, and, <laughs> and there's all this talk about, you know, nanotech bodies <coughs> and nanotech houses. And I thought, I thought of the business quantity in this chapter on, I give smooth and strive here, maybe. Uh, there's a very beautiful description of felt. Maybe, have you read this section in the, in the Thousand Plateaus? Okay, great. Remember, okay, this is a section we talked about like this 
trying to type of work is basically like a warp and wolf, and that's there's an analogy between warp and wolf and these kinds of structures with state power to be very very brief, okay? But in felt, it's a random medium. Felt is basically all these fibers you press together, and it's incredibly strong. It's very it's insulating, strong, and it has all these interesting properties. <coughs> and that was the metaphor for nomadic science, for example, uh, against state power. <coughs> so I thought about this and say, well, what's what would be very interesting is instead of making kind of starting with a priori structures of a priori schema of a priori objects, why not think about felt? So I think of thinking of Brunner's novel. Say, is it possible, you know, that maybe we can reverse the all sorts of arrows of agency and dreaming and think can felt dream of electric sheep? So I thank you for your attention. <laughs>
have a system that we can drive it by moving like this, and the music will speed up so that I'll scrub, you can scrub to the sound okay, like this. If there's some sort of, you can build in resistance so that maybe the sound is a bit sluggish, basically depends on how fast you respond to your movement, then you notice that people in the play, they'll automatically slow down. They will actually slow down. Or they might speed up. I mean, in order to sort of match the natural latencies of the system itself. So there are certain ways to play with time. So this kind of, and Rebecca, you know, she's here. We talked about this the other night, about this possibility to think about syncopation or syncopated time. Okay, we're going to all these issues. I think the best source of intuition for that would be from music, from musical performance. Another strategy, though, now that, now that you're thinking about it, which is better, because it goes with sponge ideas, I think, is don't just resort to, to tone software at all, because the whole point was to, to stick to the musical history. Um, there was a turn about, I would say, what, 10 years ago, maybe five years ago, in the experimental performance in musical circles, away from purely uh, non, uh, non-touch interfaces, you know, like the radio baton, the Max Matthews radio baton, and the lightning from Don Bokla, where basically just wave its hands in thin air, um, um, to interfaces which has some touch to it, in fact. Uh, so for example, uh, Don Bokla, as you mentioned Don Bokla, Don Bokla made these instruments were basically just basically use IR, for example, IR sensing. But later on, he invented something called the Marimba Lumina, which has an actual physical surface. You actually pound it with physical mallets. Why? Because you can use then the expectations and affordances of the body, of the human performer body. It's absolutely crucial to have done something that can actually hit against and resist. Okay. Now, why a computer? Because it allows you to do something magical. You can go like this, and once you get a knock the mallets, the usual mallet sounds of the Lumina, we can get voices. You can sh- make this thing shriek, which will go across saying, you can actually nuance this, you can actually nuance the pitch and do pitch bending that you can't do in a physical mallet. So I think that's the strategy we should play, maybe in terms of effort. But we need some effort. We do need some sort of resistance. And so. it's also, I, I, don't know, I don't know if you said something about it. Um, in, for instance, the Project T-Guard, we made a very specific choice to use acceleration sensors because we were looking at the force of bodies. We weren't trying to get the most accurate data. It gives you actually fairly coarse data. But those sensors give you the force of a moving body. So you get already a physical relationship in the data, which you wouldn't get from a camera. Absolutely crucial. The second question, and then I'll turn it over to everybody, about, is you've seen clearly a relationship between cultural production, right? projects that operate in the art and design and, and the digital media And then you've seen the work in the university, the research lab, the techno-scientific research lab. Um, clearly, the scale of those things, both the time scale as well as the funding scale, if need we not bring that up, is, is radically different. Um, clearly, so Sponge has received, as you said, uh, funding from the Rockefeller Foundation to actually explore this relationship. Why, how do these things actually cross across each other, but at the same time have different strands
say there's tea garden one and tea garden two. some sort of artistic inspiration. Here, the main line is some scientific question, scientific inquiry, okay? Whatever it could be, all right? So that's a dual picture to this kind of thing. It looks symmetric, but the main difference is economy, is, is, is money. There is no solution today to this, to, to this asymmetry. And one of the questions that's really absorbing me is to see, to take a meta level question, and see, can we come up with a, an economy in which we can come up with new modes of cultural production. Because you see, this kind of stuff is supported by, let's say, funds for events, funds for events, but foundations do not pay for this arrow here. You have to live and pay the rent to get from this event to this event. Very few countries like the Netherlands have like a living site and a living wage or be, they, would, they would pay any artist that satisfies very this criteria to just survive, basically between pockets. We know this, okay? What do we do in the United States? We have to go out and maybe, you know, make advertisements, for example, 30 second spots for this or that. So here, there is a model for this kind of stuff, but we know very well, okay? It's very hard to convince the National Science Foundation to do this, to fund this kind of research when in fact it's actually, you know, it's actually something like this, okay? This doesn't hold water. And for good reason, too, okay? I think it's not honest to really say, pretend that those kind of Around, and then bring some ideas back into play. This is two 
Sociology, let's take sociology as an example. I don't remember the name, I think it's Huntington, I can't remember now. The, during the Vietnam War, I just, I was, I sh maybe someone can tell me the right name, because I don't want to do this on recording and make a mess of it. There was a sociologist, uh, Serge Lange actually had a vendetta against this man. Um, and there was a sociologist who during the Vietnam War was doing research on these back I'm talking about technologies of expression, like a technology of mise en scène, which allows us to be more expressive. But at every single moment, we have to make a decision. Every single moment, I, well not just me, but you too, if you put on the glove, you have to make a decision at that moment if you're going to use us to make a caress or to show somebody's heart for three years with that, with that caress, okay? So in other words, I would say that every single moment,
continuously perform ethics. That's why I'm talking about ethical aesthetic gestural technology. Except that in your diagram of funding, where the funding is coming from is the concern that she has. So that in the end, who owns the technology is not you to make that decision, but it's the other people that she has this concern. In fact, in fact, I have not applied for grants. No grants. I chose not to be applying for any grants. Which means that next year I'm going to. I mean, if you look back in, this is not my area, but if you look back in history of the theater or history of musical performance, um, people were using sensors and light sensors even, and motion sensors 50 years ago. It's not, in other words, this, it's a myth of progress. It's a myth, I mean, if you look at, you know, even just staying within computer science, look at research, people, uh, in 1965, 1979, uh, 1970, in that period of time, Alan Sutherland, a great computer graphics guy, was talking about a sketch system. He did free sketch on a blackboard and interpret your gestures. Or Douglas Engelbart, the inventor of the mouse, right? He was talking about video conferencing back in like, 1972. Or the theremin. Take, 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 take further back. Take yeah. further back. Or look at the experiments in the Bauhaus, you know, fighting. So look at M M Olivia Mastien experiments with you know. So, so okay. So this, 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 uh, this. I think there's less of a less of a progress um, arc than engineers and scientists. Modernists like us to believe. If you read Bruno Latour's work, for example, you see very clearly that this kind of, or Foucault himself, I mean, points out this very clearly. I mean, the, the myth of progress and decadence is a hallmark of modernism. Okay? I'm not postmodernist, but I do think that is actually has a lot of truth to it. Now, this, I think, however, that technology is more like poetry, or mathematics is more like poetry. You can think of it that way. That is, in the sense that we all use the same words all the time. But the beautiful part of poetry, I should be a little bit embarrassed to speak about this in front of poets. Um, I think the lovely, the, the, the beauty of poetry is that, <clears throat> not that it obeys some sort of law of progress, but that we're using the same vocabulary, but and yet we're able to say something new. Okay, so it's in that spirit I'd like to work with technologies as a material. It's the same material, it's not that it's better, it's not like it's more advanced, in fact, it's not. It's not. Okay? But in order to make a poetic expression, okay, poetic and poetic, that is, it's, cr it's a creative gesture. In fact, there's nothing more robust or fragile in this kind of stuff, really, than 
It's more a matter of expertise and experience. That is, if I take 20 years to learn how to work with wood, I would be just as good with it, more familiar and accustomed to that and habitual with that as I would be with software. Like that. So, so it's, it's, it's a different kind of, you know, it really, I think, changes the description. And it changes the way that you, uh, we would have to treat the question. We think of it that way, let go of the modernist. Exactly. 
how many of you have heard about you know, the, the open source type stuff, right? Open source, you must have all heard about open source. And I, I don't know, what, I'm curious to see what you guys think about this. I mean, would you release your, your work under, would you release your work, on how you release your work under open source license? Yes? What kind of work is this? What, what are you talking about, software? Uh, other than software, are you probably doing other kind of work? What kind of work is that? I make buildings. Everybody takes whatever they like for any part of the city. Oh, what do you make? What do you make? Buildings. Ha! Ah, fascinating. You can't protect the property that way. Fascinating. I mean, we didn't talk about this. <laughs> sound. Okay, sound pieces. Okay, but, but it's interesting, right? I mean, um, it works with software. Sorry, another example? Other kinds of media? Well, <laughs> and instrument making, that is very important. And there's a circulation mechanism for that, but I very much insist on with my students. And in the scholarly domain, is citation. Because we must, I see this, you must cite who you ripped off the code from, okay? Because that's your way of thanking the person. You're not paying them anything, but you must, you must cite them so their reputation capital is increased. This is not done so much in the art domain, it's very much done in the scholarly domain, because we've had 1,400, 700 years of development of an etiquette in scholarly practice of citation, because that's the only way that we poor academics can basically uh, give incentive to each other for sharing knowledge, and knowledge gains in value and circulation. I think something like that kind of practice, that kind of etiquette should also occur in cultural production in general. Story. I was affiliated with Interval Research, <laughs> Interval Research, which I, I don't know if any of you have heard about this, but Interval Research for 10 years, or maybe more. It was started by Paul Allen, who is one of the founders of Microsoft, and of course, uh, one of the richest men in the world. And for his 
toy, he started a company called Interval Research near Stanford University. His job was to do collect the most brilliant geniuses in computer graphic, computer science at that time, like the uh, okay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then bring them together in a think tank that was supposed to work like this, that they would bring in knowledge, but they would never publish outside. Okay? So just accumulate, accumulate, accumulate knowledge. And then their job was to produce new industries, not products, but whole new industries, each of which would have to be worth $100 million or more okay, in order to be worth talking about. And I was inside this little thing near the end. And I could see, basically, the collapse. Because nobody, I thought, would want to talk to them. I mean, you go and give a talk, right? I give a talk and do research. I said, indeed, I could not talk about it. I, uh, I guess they're, they're gone, so I guess I can talk about it now, right? Maybe not. I, but I could not say to anybody outside what I saw inside, right? Turn it up, okay? So who would, who would ever want to engage with this organism? So that proves to me, I mean, not, I mean, there are many other reasons that knowledge gains value only in circulation. And economists, even you know, neoclassical economists, agree that knowledge is unlike coal, water, diamonds. It doesn't work by scarcity. It gains value in circulation. So the people, the, the, the people trying to treat knowledge in that way, they fail. They fail. So fine, they can they can try to point to, but they can go back. In fact, Interval actually threatened to destroy a lot of the archives of, of the work, even after the company closed, because it all it didn't want it into the public domain. So. But I still say people, I don't believe the open source people, because I, I think that you know, we need to be credited for our work. I mean, we need, in other words, there should be some incentive. I mean, I think basically it should be some incentive for personal creativity, right? So I think the way to do it is something involving this idea of, of credit, of credit and citation and acknowledgement. Uh, I think we should acknowledge each other. I think it's really crucial. Okay, we can, oh yeah, just, we can do it over drinks. <laughs> Take it very seriously. Okay, take it very 
very seriously. Now, okay, get, put these together. What can we do? What can we do? Right? Yes, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Substrate. <laughs> I'm an explicit subject, this is an explicit state, okay? You know, I'm an explicit consumer, this is an explicit marketing firm or some firm, okay? It's true, it may be, that is, I don't know if explicit objects and entities and power and things like this, the only response we can make, I think it is, Portrait's right, is. That's only, only, how does it, unanswerable response we can make is to commit suicide, not to, I'm shocked, okay, let me just, it's very important, okay, I'll take your, take your response. It's not like we can, I've done a lot of this stuff with, you know, like boycotting grapes and things like that. This is true. Okay, we can do that kind of thing. Now, substrate. This is why I say substrate is so important to me, personally. Personally. Because it's not that it's below, but it's imminent. It's not above or below. It's not like appealing to God or appealing to Mars and appealing to this or that. Okay, that's outside our everyday world. Nor is it below in the sense of appealing to mathematics like, like, or physics that's below everything, foundational thing. Substrate to me is kind of an imminent is it's, it's language, it's eros, it's software, it's ceramics, it's fabric, okay? It's within that domain I want to be able to see. That's why I'm very interested in, in how objects emerge and, and, and dissolve back into substrates. So that we can always take another position, we can always take, maybe introduce friction or resistance, okay? So we can always basically make foreign points of view or attachments and detachments, okay? It's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, um, a material response to the problem that's posed by folks like Negri and Carson Empire. This is just the beginning of the conversation. Please, John. Well, it's all unrelated, but, I'm, I'm, but there is, it, there's not food. Yes. Yes, that's a better story of passivity. Yes. Well, not just passivity. Passivity is a sort of belief. It's just the fact that you just don't get anything. You don't, you don't relate. Um, just a week ago, I went to visit my dear friends and actually inspirations, Nicholas Damiris and Helga Wilde, and then a friend of theirs who's a philosopher named Stefano Franchi. I say these things very clearly because I would like people to record this and remember this. And they're writing a book called um, something like Passion and Passivity. And their notion of passivity is more like how you're describing inaction, non-action. Um, and they are certainly, in fact, when I read their work, it's very much reminiscent of Taoism or Quietism, but it's not, they don't explicitly use those techniques, but they're basing their work on Western philosophy. But part of this, I think, is actually more radical than what I've been saying tonight to this point. In June, I'm hoping to have a conf uh, be in a panel with them, along with Chris and Joe Ryan, in um, uh, Society of Literature and Science in Paris, where we'll present our work on topological media and imminence and things like this, but they're going to come back and say to us, okay, but you can actually go a little bit more or a little bit less, do less. And in fact, take this position of what they call <coughs> imminent responsivity, which is a way to think about passivity, which is kind of an inaction, which is not actually doing, don't actually do, don't actually enact, okay? Which is, um, and the way they see the work that we're doing topological media is that they think, see this as a way to actually think about the world ontologically as the medium in which one cannot do. 